relationship between um, QBI and um, uh, SBI uh, at University College Dublin. And uh, today we got um, a great uh, presentation from Alexei Rukalenko. He's a research scientist at um, Systems Biology Ireland at UCD. He received his master's in um, applied mathematics and physics and his PhD in mathematical modeling from the Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology. During this time, uh, he was involved in uh, modeling of blood flow and coagulation. Uh, he moved to UCD in uh, 2015, where he's been studying intracellular signaling transduction networks, looking at dynamic modeling of signaling cascades and data-driven reconstruction of the signal transduction networks, among other things. Uh, and I think this is what he's going to be focused on today during his presentation. So it's great to have you here, Alexi. So thank you very much for a kind introduction. Uh, can you see my slides? Not yet. Please let me know when you can. I started sharing. I can see it. See? Yep. Uh -huh. Okay, so I can start, yes? I mm -hmm. don't see it yet, I guess. It just says you've started screen sharing without any slides. I can oh, see uh, it. Yeah, we see it. Can you guys see I it? can see it too, yeah. Oh, okay, I think maybe it's my internet. Okay, so go ahead, Alexi. Okay, thank you very much for kind introduction. So uh, today, uh, actually there are two authors of this talk I'm presenting, but so what was done was done uh, together with Professor Boris Kolodenko, and he's the head of the group. And um, since the title of the talk involves word multi-scaling, uh, what, how do we understand the term uh, multi-scale modeling? What do we mean? So uh, there are a number of different uh, scales that we can look at the cell and processes which are going on there. And I will not be too much wrong if I say that these are two different, uh, three different worlds which hardly connect each other. So either we'll focus on protein structure and then we practically use none of the knowledge of uh, how the signaling pathways works and how the omics data works, or we focus on signaling pathways and then we assume that uh, all inhibitors work, all signaling works as expected, and we don't take into account any structural details or uh, omics data, or we focus on omics and then we lose the idea of signaling pathways because we uh, have too much data. And now a view what is multi-scale is building bridges between these walls and uh, trying to take at least two of them into consideration simultaneously. And this is what uh, I'm going to focus today. So there will be two parts in the talk. First part will be uh, connecting protein structure and signaling pathways. And we call this technique structure-based modeling. And the second part is connecting omics data and signaling pathways. And this is what we call CSTAR, abbreviation from cell state transition assessment and regulation. And they all un unified by analysis of biological networks. So let's go to part one. Uh, so uh, we will start actually from the pathway. Here, what you see is so-called MAPT signaling pathway, or more precisely, ERC signaling pathway. And this pathway is overactivated in about 50% of all cancers. So this is one of the main drivers of oncogenic cell proliferation. It can have activating mutations on different levels, and uh, which lead to hyperactivation of this pathway. Uh, for example, if the muta activating mutation happens in BRAF, the well-known BRAF V600D mutation, uh, there are nice inhibitors, uh, RAF inhibitors, the morafenib, the brafenib, and some others, which work really nicely. On the right, uh, you see the picture of a kind of typical case where there is a patient with metastatic melanoma, BRAF mutant melanoma, a lot of metastasis. He starts taking uh, these RAF inhibitors. Uh, all the metastases are wiped out, wiped out like a magic bullet. But unfortunately, in six to eight months, uh, resistance uh, occurs in most of the cases. And all the metastases uh, grow up back in the same place as they were before. And inhibitors do not work anymore. And uh, in most of the cases, this resistance is mediated by reactivation of this pathway. So this pathway was inhibited, but then it activates once again. And this is what drives uh, the resistance. 
if there is an activating mutation in RAS proteins, uh, these RAF inhibitors paradoxically activate the signaling instead of inhibit NIC, and nothing works. Actually, uh, RAS, RAS mutations themselves account for about 30% of all cancers, including the most deadly ones like pancreatic, lung cancer, uh, colorectal cancer, melanoma, acute myeloid leukemia, and some others. And uh, RAS is currently already not completely undruggable. There are specific inhibitors for G12C mutations, but this G12C mutation is uh, prevalent in lung cancer, but it is not prevalent in other cancers. So basically all other mutations except of G2C are undruggable, and this is one of the kind of worst situations ever. So RAS is the worst concogen. It signals through ERK pathway, can we inhibit it? To understand it, we must understand what leads to reactivation of ERK pathway. So to come to this question, we started from network analysis. We used the theory developed by uh, Boris Holodenko. It's called modular response analysis. So here you can see one of the main equations of this theory, uh, which connects uh, system levels uh, responses to the drugs. So how each node of signaling network responds. And to determine it, we must know network topology, quantitative network topology, and how uh, primary drug targets respond to drugs. Given this knowledge, we can calculate the system levels responses. And we try to analyze um, different arbitrary networks and to uh, figure out which network adaptations can fully restore signaling after drug inhibition. So important here, we focused on complete reactivation, not like 50%, but 100% or even more. So. For example, consider a situation, we have network, we have inhibitor, we apply it, we see inhibition first and after that reactivation. When can this happen? So first, there is a lot of literature dedicated to negative feedbacks and their important in resistance. So a typical case is the linears activating a pathway like this, where there is chain of activating reactions from protein X1 to protein target, and we apply inhibitor. So target has a negative feedback to the upstream and uh, this negative feedback can give some resistance. For example, here you can see drug responses, uh, where there is no feedback, where there is weak feedback and very strong feedback. So indeed, the stronger the feedback, uh, the harder they inhibit this pathway. But importantly, negative feedback itself will never result in 100% reactivation. Still the higher doses of drugs will work. And if feedback is really too much strong, we will simply see oscillations as you can see on the right. So either we have uh, some partial reactivation as you can see in the middle or oscillatory behavior. And then we try to, uh, and we actually proved that for arbitrary network with, arbi with uh, one activating route and arbitrary numbers of uh, positive and negative feedback connections, Importantly, that activating route is only one, but uh, connect, feedback connections can be as much as possible. In such cases, no combination of positive and negative feedback connections can completely restore the signaling. Whatever we have, we have only partial reactivation. But clinically, we know that uh, complete reactivation is observed. What can lead to this? So we found two things which can. First is network effects. If there are two or more activating routes, for example, here from protein X1, we have two routes, either from protein Y or from protein X to the target, and one pathway inhibits and the other activates. In such case, we can have paradoxical drug responses when we give drug and the signaling increases. And depending on the parameters, you can see either picture in the middle or on the right. And in this case, if we have additional feedback, it will modulate this effect of paradoxical activation by drug, but it will never cause it. And the second case, if uh, primary drug targets are activated by inhibitor, which means inhibitor doesn't really hit its target. So now we will dig more into point two, because this is kind of something surprising. Inhibitors are supposed to hit their targets, otherwise they wouldn't be inhibitors. But uh, using the theory developed by uh, Boris Kolodenko, um, we found that actually when we have a uh, target as a monomer protein, we all know what KD means. It means the equilibrium between uh, 
inhibitor bound and inhibitor unbound states everyone knows it but when inhibitor forms dimers or oligomers the dissociation constant which means the affinity of binding first second and maybe even next molecules to the protein complex may differ first molecule can bind easily the second molecule can be bind much harder and we applied general thermodynamic rules to figure out what can uh, how this resistance can be developed uh, this is a very interesting um, thermodynamical model but it doesn't give us insight into structural details why this happens uh, based on protein structure so uh, we have the thermodynamical model and now we try to bring structure into it so what we did we analyzed all publicly available uh, structures of uh, rough Chinese domains and it appeared that all of them mainly differ by positions of two um, intermolecular motifs this is alpha c helix and dfg loop and although uh, here on the right you can see the classification based on the angle of alpha c helix and the distance of uh, moving of dfg loop and although there are a number of structures that, and each inhibitor locks uh, the crystal structure in a bit different conformations roughly we can say that all of them can be divided into in and out positions so both dfg motif can be in in and out position and alpha c helix can be in, in and out position so totally we have four different conformations and we have found only three of them in, in publicly available crystal structures there are no uh, double out positions importantly we also found from structures that in the rough dimer and if rough is not mutated for example in case when ras is mutated and rough and wild type in this case rough signals as a dimer and in this dimer two alpha c helices from different protomers cannot simultaneously occupy out position this is very thermodynamically disadvantageous so if one position if one alpha c helix in position out the other will move into position in so, uh, and this is not only classification of crystal structures, this is also classification of inhibitors. So all rough inhibitors, regardless of their generation and whether they're modern or old, they all fall into three categories, depending on preferable conformation of DFG domain and alpha C helix. And uh, then we try to perform docking simulations, trying to understand what is more important, conformational selectivity or isoform selectivity. And we found that uh, isoform selectivity can have found two to three fold change in affinity, which corresponds to the uh, KD measured in purified systems. But conformation specificity results in more than 100 fold specificity in affinity, which means that for rough inhibitors, the conformational specificity plays much more important role than isoform specificity. Whether it's pan rough inhibitor or CRO specific or BRO specific is not that much important. What really is important is which structure of rough kinase domain it prefers. And uh, these different uh, positions of DFG and alpha C is not artifact of crystal structure. Uh, these are MD simulations, molecular dynamic simulations, showing that both DFG and alpha C helix, they constantly flip between uh, in and out positions due to thermal motions if we don't lock them with inhibitor. So protein breathes with uh, these movements and there is no one canonical structure of protein these positions are in constant movement so we try to took this knowledge of structure and of uh, conformational transitions add this with the knowledge of all important phosphocytes and mapkey pathway and incorporate this all to the model and this in principle how this model uh, roughly looks like so uh, there is a lot of rules and a lot of reactions this is combinatorial complexity, so I will not write equations here. There are more than 1,000 equations. But in principle, what we have is that we consider every protein as a structured object which have different phosphocytes and domains. Domains can bind each other. Phosphocytes can be phosphorylated or dephosphorylated. And when we come to the reactions of uh, binding domains, like dimerization, we consider all possible um, dimers uh, with BRF and CRF, homo and heterodimers, with one or two molecules of inhibitors. And when we consider the reaction of binding inhibitor, we consider that uh, the kinase domain of RAF molecule can be in different positions of alpha C and DFG. And uh, we ran the simulations of this model, trying to understand how better to inhibit MAPK pathway. And we came with a counterintuitive 
suggestion that one of the best, actually the best combination would be combining two rough inhibitors, basically targeting the same pocket in rough kinase, but locking it in different conformations. Uh, so here is the cartoon which explains why this is, works. So we have Newton truss, wild type rough. Rough is in a dimer. It's kinase active and it phosphorylates MAC. Then we use, uh, for example, a uh, type one and a half inhibitor like the Morafinib. It locks uh, the one of the molecules in a dimer in the gene alpha cell positions. Uh, since two alpha C helixes cannot occupy out position, the alpha C helixes of other protomer uh, is in in position. And this is why the second molecule of the Morafinib cannot bind. But if we take uh, the alpha C in inhibitor, for example, type 2 inhibitor like serafinib or some new inhibitors like type 580, uh, RAF 265, and others, the, this is exactly the conformations which they prefer. And this is why how we use two different molecules to inhibit the same dimer. If we use uh, alpha C in inhibitor straight away, well, actually, it can bind to both protomers in high doses. But at low doses, uh, still uh, locking the pro one protomer in alpha C in position moves a bit the equilibrium of alpha C helix motion in the other to out of first position. And this is why there is still thermodynamical disadvantage of binding the second molecule, although not that big. And on the right, you can see the simulations of the model showing that we combine uh, two different types. And we see a phosphor response, which model gives us. And the red curve combination shows that uh, combining this inhibitor together, we can uh, use less dose to achieve better effect. And on the bottom, you see a number of experiments where we tested different RAS mutant melanoma and pancreatic cancer cell lines. In all cases uh, where you see those response, red curve is combination. And for combination, we plot, plot the sum of the doses. Uh, and we see that combination indeed works better. Probably the most easy to understand is the bar plot on the right, where we take uh, high doses of emorafinib and serafinib on its own. And then in combination, we decrease the dose twice. And still we see the better effect. So this is what we call synergy, when we can take less drugs and give the better effect. And uh, to analyze synergy formally, we introduced these methods, which are called Luve isoballs and allow cho combination index. Uh, the main idea between, behind these methods is that uh, the drug cannot antagonize or synergize with itself. So if we plot uh, isoball lines of constant inhibition, if they are straight, this means this is additivity, two drugs works as dilution of one another. If they can cave, this is synergy. If they can vex, this is antagonism. And show index uh, CI is a simply quantitative measure of how isoboles are concave or convex. And uh, we run a number of experiments, not only for signaling, but for proliferation in many different cell lines. Here you can see one dimension of those response curves, Luve isoboles, which are two dimensional response curves and uh, results of colony formation assay. And, this, uh, and we see that in uh, pancreatic cancer cell lines, colorectal cancer cell lines, acute myeloid leukemia cell lines, melanoma cell lines, in all rasmutin cell lines, we see strong synergy between different types of uh, RAF inhibitors. And it is, doesn't matter which exactly we inhibitors take in combination. For example, we can take serafinib or type 580 as a type 2 inhibitor. As long as they belong to the same structural type, they will synergize with the marafinib. And it doesn't matter whether we take Vimorafinib or Encarafinib. Still, as long as they're from the same structural type, they will synergize. Um, and next, we try to analyze, compare the efficiency of these double rough combinations with other combinations. For example, recently there are a number of publications uh, suggesting combine type 2 rough inhibitors with MAC inhibitors. And uh, in short, uh, if uh, this combination of MAC and type 2 RAF inhibitor indeed synergistic, given the fact that uh, the concentration of type 2 RAF inhibitor is high, then all good and we see synergy. But if the concentration of type 2 RAF inhibitor is low, the type 2 RAF inhibitor activates the pathway, so-called paradoxical activation given low doses, and MAC inhibitor inhibits the pathway. So they work in different directions and we see antagonism. The unique feature of uh, 
combination of two different RAF inhibitors is that it decreases this range of paradoxical activation. This is why we see synergy in much wider doses. We tested it in n mutant cell lines, one from melanoma, one from acute myeloid leukemia. We specifically took not really high doses of uh, type 2 RAF inhibitors. For example, here it was 30 nanomore of uh, TAC inhibitor. And we also tested uh, MAC inhibitor on its own and type 1 and a half inhibitor and so on. So vimorafinib or encarafinib. Type 1 and a half inhibitors uh, activate or weakly inhibit the pathway. Type 2 RAF inhibitor TAC uh, weakly activates the pathway. And what we see is uh, in melanoma cell and Mojusa, the combination of TAC and cobimetinib MAC inhibitor is to some extent synergistic. In acute myeloid leukemia, actually, it's antagonistic. This paradoxical activation by type 2 RAF inhibitors really uh, impedes working of MAC inhibitor in this dose. But in both cases, if we add this dose of type 1 and a half inhibitor, we see much stronger synergy. So this is kind of interesting. We take two inhibitors in the doses where they activate the pathway. We combine them, and we see nice inhibition. So exactly when we will see this border between synergy antagonism depends on exact parameters, feedback strengths, and that's so. But the general conclusion of these ranges is really robust in NRAS mutant cancers. Now we try to consider a detailized model for KRAS mutant cancers. Uh, and they're a story a bit different, and we will tell about this later. So next direction of development and refining this model is that our classification of rough structure of rough kinase domains is based on uh, static crystal structures. And uh, we started collaboration with Professor Ravi Radhakrishnan from Yale, who is expert in molecular dynamic simulations, trying to find um, whether we will see more stable uh, confirmations of rough kinase domain when we run molecular dynamic simulations. And here on the right, you can see that indeed, when we write so-called metadynamic simulations, we see more uh, valleys and a local minima of energy, meaning that instead of having four different positions of kinase domain, we actually have nine. Okay. But uh, the good thing is that our, all this approach is quite flexible, and we describe these conformational transitions in one module of the model, and all the pathway knowledge is in the other module of the model. So we can easily incorporate this knowledge to refine it and to build more detailed model uh, of a map kinase pathway, taking into account this data coming from molecular dynamics. So we can refine it given more uh, knowledge about how exactly the protein works. And uh, then uh, another direction was that we know that most kinases dimerize. And uh, we know that in some cases, kinase dimerization is a problem. So maybe in other cases beyond RAF, we also can find the cases where combining two inhibitors targeting the same kinase but in different conformations can be synergistic. So if this is counterintuitive idea worked in one case, can it work in the other? And it seems yes, indeed. Uh, we found at least three cases when it can. We're now trying to find more. This is uh, raw family kinases, Jack and RBB, and we filed a patent application to protect the whole idea of combining two different inhibitors targeting the same kinase. So I will tell a bit more about uh, RBB story. So uh, in 2018, there was a nice paper in ELIFE showing that if we add heregulin, then uh, HER2 inhibitor lapatinib in a wide range of doses paradoxically increases the proliferation of HER2 positive breast cancer cell lines, and only in very high doses it inhibits it. So basically lapatinib works well when there is no heregulin or uregulin, this is synonyms, but if we add heregulin, lapatinib doesn't work. So it looks like a little bit like paradoxical activation we saw in case of RAF. And it, represent, it reproduced in 2D assays, in 3D assays, and in different cell lines. So effect is quite robust. And in addition, we found the, the publication suggesting that uh, ARBB inhibitors uh, like erlotinib and lapatinib and gefitinib, they all induce dimerization of uh, different ARBB receptors. Here you see the luciferase completion assay on the left showing that basically every RBB inhibitor induces uh, RBB dimers to greater or lesser extent. 
So this indeed looks like uh, paradoxical activation by rough inhibitors because we have uh, all the components in the story. Inhibitors induce dimerization. Dimerization results in activation of RBB, and we see paradoxical activation in cellular proliferation. So we developed a model here as well. On the right, you can see different kinetic schemes. Since there is a number of different ligands and different receptors, again, the model is highly combinatorial complex, and I cannot present all of them, all of the model. But basically, model suggested that combining uh, lapatinib with type 1 RBB inhibitors, like gefitinib, erlotinib, or afatinib, will be synergistic in case where uh, cells are resistant to lapatinib on its own. And we tested it in uh, different herpositive breast cancer cell lines. Uh, all of these three cell lines, U565, SKDR3, and BT474, they are herpositive breast cancer cell lines. And uh, in all these cases, they are sensitive to lapatinib. We add uh, heregulin, they're resistant to lapatinib. And then we add gefitinib, and we see that gefitinib uh, helps to work to lapatinib. So isobols are concave. In combination, we need less dose. And on the right, you can see one dimensional section where it shows that combination kills the cells much better than each of the inhibitors on its own. So similar story we have with Jack, and we try to kind of expand this, but it seems like the whole idea of combining two small molecule inhibitors, quite paradoxical, works. And one of the our best news for the last time is that uh, we started clinical collaboration with uh, Tijen and Honor Health Institutes in Arizona, United States, and our clinical collaborators started recently the clinical trial of combining uh, different RAF inhibitors in pancreatic cancer. Since serafinib is the only type 2 FDA-approved RAF inhibitors, we have to use this because we had to use FDA-approved inhibitors, but uh, still our experiments show that combination of fumarafinib and serafinib is quite effective in, of, uh, in uh, suppressing proliferation of pancreatic cancer cells. And we are really very happy to see that it came to the clinical trial. To our knowledge, this is the first clinical trial, which is based on mathematical modeling. So now, finger crossed, it will work. And now I'm coming to the part two. In the second part of my talk, I will tell about how we combine the pathway knowledge with omics data. And uh, to combine them, uh, we developed so-called approach, which we call C-STAR, so state transition assessment and regulation. So uh, initially, like long time ago, Weddington suggested that uh, cellular sulfate decision, differentiation, or any other sulfate decision can be imagined like a moving of a ball in some complex landscape with different valleys. And there are points of bifurcations where I can ball go to the right or to the left. And since that time, there were many attempts to actually build this landscape to visualize this process of sulfate decision. And uh, our approach also aims not only to build it, but to understand how to control this landscape by different drug perturbations. So here there is a briefly pipeline. We start with uh, omics data. We use a supervised machine learning to uh, distinguish between different cell states. Then we build some new entity which we call state transition vector, STV. And this vector uh, gives us the core network. So main idea is to distill the core network which drives the sulfate decision. And then we use causative network inference to understand how this core network is wired and how it affects the rest of the signaling. And then we build the model where the core is modeled mechanistically and the rest is modeled phenomenologic, in phenomenological fashion. And uh, then we have exact equations for how the landscape uh, is shaping. So now I will explain it more into detail. Uh, first example from which we started was uh, neuroblastoma. Uh, in neuroblastoma, there are two receptors of TRK family, TRKA and TRKB. They activate the same downstream signaling pathways, but activation of TRKA receptor results in cell differentiation and partial apoptosis, and activation of TRKB receptor results in massive proliferation. Clinically, we know that expression of TRKA is associated with good prognosis, and expression of TRKB is associated with bad prognosis. And we had the isogenic uh, 
cell line system based on SH SY5Y cells, which do not express either of, either of these receptors initially. And uh, then from this, they have derived two different cell lines, the cell lines ectopically expressing TRK receptor and TRK B receptor. On the right, you can see that indeed, we reproduce this case that in isogenic system, activation of TRK A receptor results in several differentiation, activation of TRK B in massive proliferation. And we started the question, how we can switch between different cell phase decisions? How we can make TRK B cells behave like TRK A cells? We started with the omics data. Uh, we used RPPA phosphoproteomics first uh, for about uh, more than 100 different antibodies. And uh, we used these uh, data to, and then we used machine learning to distinguish between TRK and TRK B cell states. Uh, we used in this case uh, SVM, support vector machines. So on the right, you can see kind of visualization of this. So to be, we cannot visual, visualize 100 dimensional space. So we use PCA, but PCA is used only for visualization purposes. All mathematics were done in initial 100 dimensional space. And in this case, uh, we use SVM to build the separation plane. And then we build the vector, which comes from the centroid of one cloud to the centroid of the other cloud. And this vector is called STV. So this vector is usually is uh, faces nearly in the same direction as normal to this uh, hyperplane. And then we analyze the composition of this STV. And the highest contributors to this are assumably the coordinate work which drives uh, the, the rest of the changes. This was our main assumption that we can distill the coordinate work by looking at the top components contributing to STV. And uh, then we figured out what is our coordinate work and uh, perturbed each of these uh, nodes of this coordinate work and used the method developed by uh, Boris Holodenko, uh, Bayesian model response analysis to reconstruct the network wiring. You can see that the network wiring is really different between different receptors. And, but next, we must understand, okay, this is how the, this coordinate work proteins affect each other, but how they affect the rest of the signaling. And to do this, we introduced a new entity, which is called Dynamic Phenotype Descriptor, DPD. And basically, this is just the distance from uh, some specific point to the separation hyperplane. So, for example, we had the situation where we had uh, the centroid for Turkey B cells. And it had some distance to the separation plane. Then we introduced some inhibitor, for example, RSK inhibitor, and this distance changed. It became closer. And uh, if this distance became closer, which mean, this means that cells became closer to differentiation state. And this distance, which here is black line, we call DPD, dynamic phenotype descriptor. And this is a number. And number, this can be introduced into network reconstruction just in the same way as any other number like phospho erc phospho kt or phospho gnk levels so we can use this distance as a new entity in the network reconstruction and we can understand how different kinases affect this distance so how they affect dpd presuming that uh, this means they how they affect phenotype and overall signaling pattern through all of the cell so uh, we Use this assumption. We reconstructed these uh, networks together with DPD module. We saw a different wiring of both core network and the connections to the DPD. And then uh, we need to write differential equations to build to build ODE model. So how to build ODE model for the core network is quite known task. We write the chemical reaction equations, and uh, we are experts in this. But how we can describe the behavior of DPD? How we can describe the phenotypic behavior? And this is where uh, Weddington landscape comes in. So we see that uh, different cell states are uh, separated and they have different DPD values. Next, we assume uh, having no other uh, assumptions except of that each of the states is stable, we apply the simplest. Uh, landscape 
which is assumed in uh, theoretical physics, which is parabolic landscape. So we simply assume that from the knowledge that these are stable states, we're introducing this parabolic landscape. And uh, then when we know this landscape, we can derive the forces by taking derivative of this. And this is how we write the equation for the DPD. So we assume that there are two different types of forces acting, restoring force and signaling force. Restoring force comes from landscape itself. And this is uh, internal regulation, giving the fact that proliferation state is stable and differentiation state is stable. And signaling force comes from the coordinate work. Signaling force is how different kinesis from the coordinate work affect it. And this is how we model the self aid decision. Signaling driving force is additional force on the landscape, which is kind of internal regulation of the cell. When we combine these two forces, we have final landscape describing how the cells behave. So coming to the simple uh, conclusions, this is uh, how our model behaves for TRK and TRK B cells. So we are able to visualize this landscape and to understand why in first case it uh, lives in the differentiation state and the, in the second case it lives in proliferation state. Our model reproduces this behavior and on the bottom you can see experimentally merged DPD values using omics data using the same RPPA and our model predictions which correspond to this. And now the main thing that our until that time all these measurements were just our assumption but the DPD values indeed correlate with the proliferation or differentiation of cells. If the DPD value is high, we have proliferation. If it's low, we have differentiation. And coming from the same state, in one case, we have increased differentiation, and in the other, we increase the proliferation. Now we started testing our models, giving different perturbations. So here we perturb every element of the core network, and we measured experimentally how the DPD changes and how uh, the differentiation uh, extent changes using uh, just counting the differentiation cells. And we see that in every case, we see that our model correctly reproduces the DPD, which we calculate using omics data. And this completely corresponds to the phenotypic behavior of cells. As independent control, we uh, saw that our model suggested that if we just increase constantly the activity of AKT, we will see uh, in massive proliferation of cells, regardless whether we which receptor we stimulate. And indeed, uh, experiments confirm this. And we can not only understand single drug perturbations, we can construct perturbations and, can be, and drug combinations which can selectively affect one cell and not really touch the other cells. So in this case, we found that if we combine MEK inhibitor and ERBB inhibitor, for example, gefitinib, we will see synergy in inducing of proliferation of Turkey B cells, but this combination will not change much the state of Turkey A cells. And indeed, when we uh, made experiments, we saw uh, induction of differentiation in Turkey B cells and Turkey cells are untouched. So our model allows us to find which drug combinations will selectively target one cell type and leaving alone the other cell type. So we started from the omics data and we ended in predicting how what in the landscape is shaped and how we can construct specific perturbations to purposefully switch the cell states. Uh, then we submitted this to nature and uh, reviewers asked us to apply this method to different systems. So we applied it to different systems. Oh, sorry, one more thing. Uh, first, we uh, analyzed how classical markers of differentiation behave. And indeed, we see that combination of trametinib and gefitinib induces phospho, uh, FAK phosphorylation, which is marker of differentiation. And we performed uh, mass spec phosphoproteomics to test whether all the signaling pattern of cells indeed is changing in the direction which is supposed to be, and it is. So uh, we see that TRK, TRK B cells are clearly separated using machine learning. And uh, this combination of drugs does not affect state of TRK cells, but TRK B cells are induced differentiation. And here we see that we applied 
uh, the different uh, synergy criterion just to show that uh, additive combination would result in value which is in the red bar plot and we see much lower value which means that uh, in this case this is synergistic so uh, whether we use rpp or phosphoproteomics data or based on any proteomics data we can uh, make some conclusions and build our models and next we apply it to different cell systems one of the publicly available data sets uh, was related to uh, uh, rough inhibitor resistant beer of mutant melanoma so uh, in uh, the publication, this publication 2012, it was shown that uh, PTEM deletions uh, result in uh, resistance to rough and MAC inhibitors. And this resistance is not mediated by reactivation of ROC pathway, as I told before. ROC pathway is nicely inhibited, but cells still don't die because AKT pathway is active. So in this case, there is no one driver. There are two drivers working together. And for these cells, uh, it was shown that co-inhibition of uh, MEC and PA3K indeed induces the apoptosis. So there are two drivers. And we used the uh, publicly available uh, RPPA perturbation data published in the life. And uh, we took this data and put them into our pipeline, which we developed before. So uh, first we inferred the distilled the core network and inferred its wiring. We obtained some network. But then we noticed that the authors of that paper uh, mentioned specifically the um, importance of MIC. Uh, our methods did not capture importance of MIC, but the good thing of our approach is that it is scalable. We can add or delete any of the modules and uh, for it to zoom in or zoom out our description. So we added this MIC module to the network and most of the network did not really change except of some connections which are now mediated by a MIC. So we can say that this network is quite complex, but actually it has intermediate complexity. So on the left, you can see uh, other attempts to use this data to develop uh, the mathematical model and the networks which was used there. So we can, use much more detailed model, but our aim was to build the model, which is complex enough to explain all observed phenomena, but simple enough that we can understand how it works. And uh, first uh, we calibrated the model using single drug responses. Again, using the DPD values calculated based from omics data and how a model reproduces them. You can see here these sharp transitions down, which means, uh, which reflect the threshold activation of cell apoptosis. And then we were able to analyze what is the optimal drug combination. So different combinations may be synergistic, but which will be the more synergistic? And our model suggested that although combination of MIC inhibitors and MAC inhibitors, which were suggested originally, is indeed synergistic, our model uh, suggests that combination of AKT inhibitors and inhibitors of insulin signaling should be more synergistic in this case, because uh, there is a strong feedback from mTOR to insulin receptor. And although this feedback does not result in complete reactivation signaling, it uh, very strongly buffers AKT and PS3K inhibition. And to overcome this buffering, we need to inhibit insulin. And on the bottom, you can see the predictive simulations, how the Waddington's landscape of the cells will change. And we introduce AKT inhibitor on its own, insulin inhibitor on its own, and then we take twice lower dose in combination, and we see threshold-like activation of apoptosis. And you can see this nice switching uh, showing by black arrow, showing that this is indeed a threshold phenomena, where, uh, which happens in all known fashion. And completely unrelated to this, we started uh, the collaboration with uh, groups in Boston, uh, guided by Dr. Alexander Gimelbrandt and Igor Kramnik. Um, uh, it was based on the fact that uh, Professor Igor Kramnik uh, developed the uh, nice isogenic model of sensitivity to tuberculosis. So the B6 mice, which is kind of standard mice in most of the animal research, are known to be quite resistant to tuberculosis infection. So in this case, they have formation of, after infection of tuberculosis, they have formation of granulomas, but without any signs of necrosis, and they have latent tuberculosis. And uh, Professor Igor Kramnik generated the 
sensitive mice by changing of only one locus, which is called SST1. This locus uh, encodes uh, transcription factors SP110 and SP140. And actually knocking out these two transcription factors results in the fact that instead of uh, latent TB, we have acute TB with a lot of necrosis and uh, very different sizes of granulomas. So basically, one locus uh, responds to the fact whether tuberculosis will be latent or acute. And he figured out that the main difference uh, which drives these different phenotypes of tuberculosis infection is behavior of macrophages. So we came here knowing that there is macrophages which can come to different states, and this determines the output of tuberculosis infection. And we started to analyzing the signaling in these different macrophages. The project is still ongoing, but we managed to find uh, the drug combinations which synergistically induce resistant state in sensitive macrophages. So here again, we had a number of experiments. I'm showing only uh, final experiments using uh, full RNA-seq, where uh, we uh, distinguish different uh, signaling patterns and show it that using two specific drugs, which I unfortunately cannot mention at the moment, but uh, we found the drug combination, which synergistically switched uh, the signaling to the TB resistant state. And now uh, this was based only on machine learning and RNA-seq and phenotypic experiments of how macrophages control the population of mycobacterium tuberculosis are ongoing. So the main aim here is to target macrophages to help them control bacterial population. So we're not just killing bacteria, we're actually changing the macrophage signaling, switching states of macrophages, and hopefully it will result in uh, more efficient control of bacterial populations by these macrophages. So coming back to the initial slide, how we understand the multi-scale modeling, how we can uh, understand how, how we can approach the tasks of purposeful control of self-free decisions. So we start mostly if we don't know which pathway to target from omics data, we try to distill the core network which really drives this uh, signaling pattern. And then if we need to make description of some of the modules of core network more detailed, we can do this. And we can introduce uh, the knowledge of the pathway signaling into this core network. And if after that we need to understand how, <clears throat> sorry, how a specific inhibitor works, we can do this. We can analyze specific target of this inhibitor and uh, structural properties of drug protein interaction and to incorporate this structural knowledge into the initial model of sulfate decision. And if structural knowledge itself doesn't give us too much of the insight, we can use molecular dynamics to refine it and to understand more precisely which conformational transitions are important in this case. And this is how we get the multi-scale model, which starts from the details of uh, some structural conformational transitions and ends up in omics pattern behavior. So our aim is not to make the most detailed models ever, which describes everything but to make the models detailed enough to understand how to control sulfate decisions. For example, there is, we're not obliged to describe everything in detail, <clears throat> but we can describe everything important into extent of detailness, which we need. And this is our vision of uh, how multi-scale modeling should be done. And this is how we believe we can understand how the Waddington's landscape is shaped and how to control it. So uh, I would like to thank all our collaborators in SBI and outside SBI for work with us and thank all of you for attention. All right, thank you, Alexi. Great, great stuff, really great talk here. So we have a number of questions. I guess I'll ask people to put the questions in the Q&A box. Um, I see some questions in the chat, chat box. I see that Mehdi and Klim as usual are not following instructions, but I see all the questions. I'll go through, a, a, I'll start with theirs in the uh, chat box. So Mehdi asks, have you thought about incorporating your model with an in vivo PK model to also study optimal dosing? Would you expect anything to change in this dynamical setting with respect to drug synergy? Uh, if I understand correctly, PK, you mean pharmacokinetics? Yes. 
Uh, yes, this is uh, the next step. Uh, we were doing it as a moment, actually, to make model really more predictive, we need to understand how the drug concentration changes in time. So this is next logical step to incorporate PK into this as a boundary conditions. Okay, very good. I'll just jump to the Q&A box here. Some an anonymous attendees asked, is there any synergy in the toxicity against healthy cells? So usually uh, toxicity is mediated by off targets and uh, effect is mm, positive effect is mediated by on target. So what we expect is that since we decrease the dose of the drug in combination, each of the drug, uh, the on-target effects will be increased due to drug synergy, but off-target effects will be kind of more easygoing because we use uh, less doses of each of the drugs and each of the drug has different spectrum of off-targets. So our general uh, idea is that synergy is the way to overcome problems of toxicity because toxicity is mediated by off-target and drug effect is on target. Uh, but uh, clinical trial will show, at least uh, there is an, uh, one publication showing that combination of amorafinib and serafinib is quite well tolerable. And uh, this is, gives us belief that uh, actually it will work in our case. Okay, and Klim, I'll go jump back to the, the chat. Um, have you tried incorporating the pseudokinase KSR and KSR inhibitors into your modeling, your structural pathway modeling? Uh, yes. So now uh, we have a nice uh, intern, uh, Hiraki Imota, who actually works on this. And this is why I mentioned that in case of KRS mutant cancers, uh, the story is a bit different because basically KSR and RAF, they bind with the same dimerization domain. And so this is why they actually compete for the, there is competition between rough RAF demerization and rough KSR demerization. And we found that this actually affects so that depending on KSR levels, the optimal drug combination might change. And KSR1 is mainly expressed in KRS mutant cancers. So uh, this work is currently ongoing. We hope to finish it in next months to publish these results. But basically, KSR levels indeed affect how uh, drugs response, uh, how cells respond to rough inhibitors. Okay, very good. And um, back to the Q and A. Uh, can you provide a brief overview of BMRA for network inference? So uh, BMRA. Um, just give me a second. Okay, maybe I will stop somewhere here. So um, the main idea behind MRA is that we use uh, systemic perturbations to infer uh, the wiring of core network. And so the main idea is that if we know what we perturb, we can solve this task. So we mainly reconstruct the Jacobian of the ODE system, which describes uh, this network dynamics. So uh, initially we take perturbation data, then we run this algorithm, and then we get uh, this Jacobian, which means quantified network topology. Uh, this method was just uh, developed by uh, Boris Kolodenko, and basically the Bayesian version of it uh, makes it uh, robust with respect to noise. So I can address there uh, and to a number of reviews, which we published on this case, but the main idea is actually solving reverse task. Initially, I showed you the direct task when knowing the network topology and drug responses, we calculate the systems level responses. And here we solve the reverse. We know the system level responses and primary drug responses, and then we infer the core network. So this is typical reverse task. It's um, quite hard to do, but still it's possible to do. And this method is uh, quite well published. Yeah, and I guess related, but Amanda saying, are the C star methods available for others to try? And I, I guess, yes. So C star is based on this. So main advantage of C star is that previously uh, BMRA was used to infer the connections between different kinases and how it can affect signaling as a whole is kind of a new step when BMRA became C star. Okay, Lorraine has got a question about, you showed, um, I guess, one slide on tuberculosis uh, or a couple slides. For the TB experiments, could you let us know a little bit more about what type of the macrophage you're, you are obtaining with these drugs and have you measured these effects with other types of infections that you can measure in, in macrophages? So uh, this was uh, lung alveolar macrophages, uh, primary cultures, which were taken from this mice. So these are 
So this RNA-seq experiment was on primary cultures. And uh, the lines of these mice are maintained in Boston by Professor Igor Kramnik. And uh, his main area of expertise is tuberculosis. So he tried to work with some virus infections, but mainly now he made us a task to focus on tuberculosis infection as well. So maybe when we have nice results in publication, we will upscale it to different infections. But now uh, all what we do is uh, primary cultures and TB infection. Okay, maybe I'll let Mehdi get the last word in here because I know he likes that. Um... So uh, regarding the MRA network connectivity model, each cellular context may have different wiring. Do you th think we must remeasure the network connectivity in each context separately, or is there a way to extrapolate from one context to another? Well, that's a good question. So if you, if I show you the, again, uh, wiring of TRKA, TRKB cells, we see that in the isogenic cell line, and only the receptor expression differs and the network is completely different. So first of all, we, seems, we seem have to have developed the method which um, is very specific to some cell line. It very precisely measures the regulation in one cell line and between different cell lines, it might differ a lot. So in the shape that it is now, uh, this is probably, it's like a very zooming uh, approach where uh, for every cell line, we need to make separate perturbation experiments. Um, maybe we will be able to understand what is the determinants of network connections in the future. For example, each of these connections might be mediated by expression this of that protein, but that's definitely a separate task. Now what we do is very cell line specific. So this is a little bit in contrast to most of the network work network biology, which is kind of pan cell line, pan cancer, pan everything. Here, it's very cell line specific. We got, we got I'll go, there's a couple more questions. There's a lot of um, activity here, so that's great. Uh, so Desmond uh, says, great talk. Uh, so does the huge heterogeneity of tumor cells in vivo, for example, melanoma versus much higher uh, homogeneity of these cells affect therapeutic modeling in vitro in terms of cell autonomous effects? Uh, so you mean what to do with cell heterogeneity or what is the question? Does the, yeah, I, I suppose that's right. Does the heterogeneity of the tumor cells in vivo? Um, so I guess in vivo, if, you know, you're seeing differences in vivo and in vitro. How much is that affecting the modeling? Mm, so here uh, we mainly worked in uh, controlling cell states uh, in vitro, but uh, if we take the assumption that uh, all in vivo conditions may be modeled by just adding the appropriate uh, ligands and growth factors, we basically can mimic uh, in vivo conditions and to understand how uh, signaling from this and that receptor can affect it. But our thinking in this direction is that uh, although the wiring might be really different, uh, we don't. We must we must understand only the effects which lead to resistance. So when we study uh, effect of different receptors or different kinases, we must consider the, more, the worst case situation ever and then to understand how in worst case situation ever, we can uh, suppress the oncogenic signaling. And this is how we can kind of cut all possible, way, all possible ways of uh, emerging of drug resistance. So what I mean is that if we know that in most cases, ERK signaling is a key, then we are really focused on inhibiting it in every possible way. If we know that uh, this is multi-network play, then we try to understand what is the most uh, oncogenic, the most worst situation and how to transfer it to the best one. And this is how we can uh, approach this problem because usually there is only number of subclones which are most aggressive ones. And if we understand how to knock out them, uh, how to kill them, we will be in advantage situation. Okay, we'll do the last question here from Clem. Could you speculate how does the complexity of your model networks actually compare to the complexity of the biological networks in the, in the cell state modeling? Um, so the question is that we build the models of different uh, scale of complexity. So as I said, <clears throat> uh, we start from a pretty simple models and we go step by step. If we 
understand that the simple model cannot explain uh, all possible phenomena or cannot give us insight which we need for. For example, if we don't need to inhibit ERC pathway, there is no need to introduce detailed model of uh, rough memorization. Or if we use uh, like PA3K KT inhibitors, we don't need to model uh, ERC signaling in detail. So our uh, model have <coughs> Our main approach is zoom in, zoom out. We zoom into the cases to the regions of interest, and we zoom out uh, the rest of the description, not omitting it completely, but taking it into simplified fashion. So this is why we don't try to do the super detailed networks, but the model can be quite complicated if we try to dig into details of structural transitions. All right, really great. Okay, so um, thanks, Alexi. Fantastic talk. Thanks for all the great questions as well for everybody. Um, and just to let people know the next seminar in the series, we're going to switch back now to San Francisco. Trevor Bavona is going to be uh, speaking March the 2nd, 9 a.m. California time. Uh, I think it was at 5 p.m. Um, Dublin time. Um, and Trevor's an expert on um, a lung cancer. I think Walter is going to be hosting him. Um, and, and thanks to, I want to say thanks to the QBI team. Uh, Gina, um, Alexa, and Jacqueline for a quick pivot here at the end. We had, a, um, we had to switch uh, uh, links, but you guys did it seamlessly as usual. So thanks, Alexi. And we'll look forward to seeing everybody um, March the 2nd for Trevor Bavona. Thanks very much. Yeah.